The list of his films reads like an index of modern classical cinema, winning 30 Academy nominations and six Oscar awards. God's wondrous purpose. Your body is his temple. There are hundreds of women out on the prowl. <laughs> are a roster of Hollywood greats. There are other ways to be happy, you know. Give yourself to me, Anne. Despicable. What Helen has done, I have done! It is not my place to be curious about such matters. I'd be lost without her. He is half of the extraordinary Merchant Ivory team, and I'm delighted to welcome tonight the Bombaywala turned Hollywood mogul, Ismail Merchant. Smile, it's great to have you here. I'm so glad that you could make it. Thank you. One of your short trips again to India. Yes, very short actually. <laughs> Location hunting. <laughs> yes, and also meeting the family, you know, in Bombay, everyone is here. So I come and see them. So Absolutely. they can keep tabs on you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone is fascinated by your success story. It's the big Hollywood dream. It's a formidable challenge. How did you dare to do it? Well, I think it's what, what you call it, a merchant magic. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> but is that all you're going to tell us about it? <laughs> no, no. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, it started really very young, you know, when I was only, what, nine years old. And uh, there was a big, uh, what you call it, a Muharram festival going on in where I lived in Bombay, near Bendy Bazaar, you know, Muhammad Ali Road. And uh, I was given a speech to read, and uh, it was about uh, 10 pages. And there were 10,000 people at this gathering. And at the end of the speech, they all carried me on their shoulders, you know, as if I had achieved something grand and wonderful. You loved it. So I loved it. I enjoyed <laughs> it. And I thought that, uh, well, if I could communicate to 10,000 people at the age of nine, you know, I must be doing something right. Mm. The other thing was uh, the arrival of Nimmi, and the actress. The actress. The actress who came and visited us and I took an instant liking to her and she took an instant liking to me and I used to go to the premieres uh, with her and I would not go to my school and I would go to the studios. But you were struck by the glamour initially. Well, absolutely. I mean, there is no doubt about it. I remember going with Nimmi at a premiere in her convertible green Cadillac, and people were throwing flowers at us, you know. So I thought, well, that's wonderful, you know, how a great thing it is. But you never wanted to be an actor then? Well, I, you know, in a way, you know, earlier on, there was a little bit of uh, that attraction, you of know, to be an actor. Be. And, uh, but most of the time, I wanted to be an organizer, a producer. What was your first job in films? Well, I uh, appeared in, as an extra on uh, the set of my brother-in-law. Uh, he was doing a film, and I was there all night watching the shooting. And then he said, well, why don't you appear, walk in the, in the street? You know, this was a, a street on the set. So I walked in, and I thought I was so felt so excited. I said, "Well, I'll be seeing it." Well, that scene was cut. It was cut. <laughs> yes, it wasn't even there. No, no, it was not even the film. <laughs> <laughs> You've come a long way. Yes. <laughs> but how did it happen? This Bombaywala goes to Hollywood. What does he find? How difficult is it for him there? I made the film The Creation of Women. Yes, that was that my was your first, first film. film. And I took the cans under my arm, and I went to Los Angeles, sending out a. PR release that Mr. Merchant from India, producer from India, is arriving in Hollywood. I was expecting a huge crowds of people to receive me with photographers and all, but nobody came. You know, <laughs> so that completely. <laughs> but you know, it's our, one's mind is seen. The dreams right, were The there. dreams. That's right. But tell me, what was the hardest part of your success in Hollywood? Well, the difficulties that it was always that you know when we went and presented the ideas, 
we were not accepted in the sense that we were not doing the mainstream movies. But so, being an Indian didn't make it more difficult, did it? It made it easier. And uh, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, being an Indian is a tre exotic, you know. So, I mean, I would mm. play that card. That was a trump card, being an Indian. Because I never played bank being anything, anyone else. You know, for example, Indians go to America and they suddenly change their accent. They're wow, well, you know, I'm going to do this. And, mm. you know, but I never did that. Did you ever experience any racism? Not really. <laughs> never. It was very much, I was accepted everywhere. I mean, there was never any any uh, sort of discrimination or any sort of a thing that, you know, you are an Indian, so we are going to put you in an arm's length. Mm. Never like that. As a matter of fact, that helped a lot. Mm. And there was a, a very interesting story that happened. You know, I, the film from by Paul Newman, you know, he was his first film, practically. Somebody up there likes me. Uh, and I went to see the film at Metro Cinema, and I was totally enamored by this man. Mm. And I just thought he was just the most brilliant actor. Yes. So next day I bought another ticket and I went and saw it. Third day again, you know. <laughs> and I must have seen the film five or six times. And then I went to America to study in 1958, my master's in business administration. And there was a Sweet Bird of Youth, the Tennessee William play was on. And there was Geraldine uh, Page and Paul Newman together. And I said, well, what a wonderful opportunity to go and see him in flesh Life. and blood, you know. Mm. So I went there. I bought a student ticket. I went there and after the play, I was just so taken by it. I was shattered, absolutely, and mm. so excited seeing him. And I said, well, maybe this is the only opportunity in life where I could actually go and shake his hand. So I went backstage and I told the doorman, I said that I have an appointment with Mr. Newman. <laughs> I've come from India. So he said, oh, you have an appointment with him. So number five, you know, his, stay, his dressing room was number five. So I went there, knocked at the door and said, oh, Mr. Newman, I've come and I've admired your films. You know, you must come to India and make a film with me and all of that. Uh, and I didn't even know that I was going to be, you know, making films at the time, you know. <laughs> but you look out. Idea, you know? <laughs> so I just blurted out. So he called, come on in and sit down. So I sat down in the, in the dressing room. We chatted for a bit and then he said goodbye, goodbye. And I went out and I said, well, I'll wait one more time. I may wait for a little while and look at this great man again. So he comes out of the, uh, the, the door and he's on his motorbike. And he looks at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just waiting to go home. So he said, where do you live? I said, well, I live in Washington Square, downtown. So he said, hop on. I also live in the village. So I hop on his motorbike and he drives me on Ninth Avenue. We go all the way down. He says goodbye again. And 28 years later, I'm offering him a part of Mr. Bridge, a film I'm producing. So, you know, it's quite Amazing. extraordinary, isn't Amazing. it? Amazing. And then when we were sitting there at dinner, uh, at the end of the dinner, uh, I told Paul, you remember 28 years mm -hmm. ago, I came to see you when you were doing Sweet Bird of Youth? So he took his glasses and he sort of looked at me and he said, ah, you are the crazy Indian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that set off the chain events. Things happened like that for you for the rest of your time in Hollywood, didn't they? Practically. I mean, you know, it was just uh, an amazing... I think there's also sort of, you know, that one is, uh, one is to think that the gods are with you, you know. But you often say this in your interviews, that it came to me like a gift from the gods. Yeah. Do you, and yet you don't believe in coincidences? No, I mean, I, I believe in coincidences. I think that there are certain, you know... Um, powers, you know, and there's a certain destiny. There is, you, you know, feel there that? There is, absolutely. Why don't more Indians make it in Hollywood, do you think? Well, because they are, you know, they want to copy Hollywood. You know, you cannot copy Titanic. You cannot copy, you know, the kinds of things they do. No. So what is interesting is that you make something of your own, which is totally different. So I think that is, that is what we have proven mm. in the past many, many years, that there is another cinema which deserves attention. Do you keep in touch with what's going on in the Hindi film cinema? Oh, yes, I see Hindi films. If you were to talk about the song, dance, things, I mean, I cannot accept myself, you know, doing something like that, you know. But uh, there's so many good actors we have in India. Would you ever consider casting them in any of your American films? Oh, of course. Who you would know, you I'm consider gonna, casting? Uh, uh, the the actor was Sir, what's his name Khan Shah Rukh Khan, Khan. he's wonderful, wonderful. Anil and, Kapoor is a good Anil actor. Kapoor is a very good mm. actor I mean, there are many Amitabh Bachchan would you consider? Amitabh Bachchan yes of course if there is something good and something right I would definitely cast cast him 
Uh, he's a wonderful actor. Yeah. You know, because Madhuri Dixit and uh, um, I mean, I am a great admirer of Shri Devi, you know. I mean, she's yeah. a, a. How would a they fare in Hollywood, do you think? Oh, they would go very well. Look at Madonna. She copies most of the things from the Indian musicals. She does, doesn't of she? Of course. I mean, Indian music, if you look at Helen, you know, and if you look at our musicals and the choreography, she copies a great deal. She watches them. Uh, Indian actors and, and the energy they have. Uh, there's a great, uh, great deal to offer. The Merchant Ivory partnership has grown to be a legend. 36 years and 40 films. And Ivory has said you, you operate very much like the United States government. <laughs> Am I right? It says he's the president, you're the Congress, and Ruth is the Supreme, Supreme Court. Court right? how, really, how, how does it all happen? How do you work? There's never an interference, you know. There isn't ever. There is never. You know, you, she writes it, and after she's written it, she gives it to us. But at least two of us must be committed solidly mm. to doing the film. So is she the thinker, and he the creator, and you the doer? That's right. The doer is the best. <laughs> But it is a strange cross-cultural marriage you three have, because you're an Indian Muslim, um, she's a German Ruth Jew. is German Jew, and Jim is a Christian, you know, American a Protestant. Catholic from yeah. America. No, but it is where people say that why people can't come together. I mean, here we have proven that three individuals from three different continents, and they have come, worked, lived, enjoyed, and continue to do so. What do you think makes it work? There are no egos, first of all, between there us. Aren't. We share, you know, the same mm. apartment. You know, we each have an apartment, and we meet at the weekends at the house which Jim has. Um, so our lives are never separated from the connections we have, the countries we have lived in. So I think there is never a shortage if your mind is open to things. You know, there is the world is your oyster. But tell me, Ismail, looking back, could you have made it? Without Jim? No. I think what would be, I would be a different kind of a producer, you know. Mm. Uh, I would have been a movie mogul, certainly. There is no question about it. I would have been. But a different kind. I would have worked for some big corporation, maybe. Uh, I mean, I had a, a Hollywood home, you know. You know, like many other mm. Hollywood producers have worked and lived. I mm. would have been one of them because I always wanted to make films. Mm. Uh, that would have been one aspect of it. But the other thing is I'm so lucky that I met him and I met Ruth, you know, and I yeah. met some of the most wonderful people. So do you think luck has played an important role? Oh, idea? very much so. It's been said that in, in order to make a film, Ismail would even sell his mother if he had to. I mean, you have a long history of staging outrageous stunts in pursuit of the things that you want. Money, actors, locations. You always get away with it. How do you do it? How does it work? Don't tell me it's just the charm, no, because no, no, I know no. the charm is there. <laughs> no, it's, um, I think it's the power of conviction, you know, it's convincing somebody. Now, we were just working in, in Paris. There's a place called Brasserie Il Saint Louis. And um, I was told by our location manager that it's not possible to get this location. So I said, well, well, how do you know? You know? She said, well, I've gone there, I've offered money. It's not possible, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing with the French have. So I said, well, at least let me go and see. So I went and saw. Uh, and now I had met a waiter there, and Gino, his name is. So Gino and I met, you know, we hugged each other, and you know, oh, wonderful. So uh, Gino and I told Gino that, you know, we want to make our film here, you know. So he said, oh, but Madame is not really uh, uh, interested in, you know, in letting uh, people come and film here. So I said, well, uh, I'll she hasn't met me yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I'd already seen yeah. her, but not really introduced yeah. or anything. So I went with that book of Merchant Ivory, you know, the films of Merchant Ivory, and it had, you know, the famous people, of course, the French, Isabella Gianni, there was Jean Marot, and Charlotte de Turcam. So I take the book and give it to her and say that, look, I've worked with so many people and we've been to this restaurant so many times. I want to present this book to you with you know, the, the French actors we have worked with, and I would like to bring them here. And so she said, oh, yes, you know, and she looked at the book with not very great enthusiasm. I said, but anyway, she accepted the book. I gave it to her, and I said that uh, my location manager came to see you about the, the shooting in this place. But she said, I really can't uh, give this as a location. So um, I said, well, why don't you first look at the book, enjoy, see it, you know, and maybe I'll come tomorrow and see you again. And she said, oh, yes, I have my daughter. I have to also ask her. So both the daughter... Uh, the daughter and the mother were there next day. So I went there and I sat with them, you know, I had a cup of coffee and, you know, so the book is there and it is your book, you know, it's not just for you to see, but it is your book. And um, I have a proposal and a proposition to, to, to make. So she said, well, what is it? So I said, well, if you give us this location, 
I would invite you as a host to India as my guest and take you around personally instead of paying you the fee. So they said, oh, well, all right, but maybe fee as well as that would be better, you know. <laughs> so both the fee and the two tickets to come to India and to play the host. So they agreed to it. Your thought is, you know instinctively where people are vulnerable and where they can be reached. Well, everyone has some corner which is vulnerable. And I think one is not, it's not the question of taking an advantage of someone's vulnerability, but it's a question of convincing someone and seeing it your way. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's in Urdu, you know, saying that Khudi ko kar buland itna ke har takbir se Khuda bande se puche batate hi raza kya hai. God comes and tells you or asks you, what do you want if you knock at his doors yes. enough times? So here he has. It has been given to us. But um, success does necessitate a degree of ruthlessness, don't you feel? Well, ruthlessness in the sense that if, if you want to achieve something, you know, on your terms, then obviously you have to have an attitude which is ruthless. You know, you have to step on people's toes, perhaps. You have to alienate a few people. Because everything cannot be just uh, a wonderful, good, grand experience, you know. Ismail, what does it take to win? To win? To win in life. <laughs> but I've already won. How do you measure success today? Like you say, I've already won. Well, I mean, success in this, I mean, everybody knows Merchant Ivory's name in cinema will go in a special place. So that's it. That's winning, you know. Personally? How Personally, I always have that maabab ki dua hoti hai. You know, mm. there are prayers of, of your parents, not just for me, but for everybody, you know. That is a very important thing. For me, wealth doesn't count. I it have no, no, it has no interest in me at all. How I can you no say interest. that? Absolutely. If I didn't have money, I still would make a film. I said, there's Ruth who would write without money, there's Jim who would write, there'd be actors who would play without thing. I would cook for them, I would you know, get loan, whatever it is, but I would make the film. I would go to windows, people, you know, and I would do it. So it's not the money that sort of you know, pushes you to do something. Or it's not the, I have millions of dollars or I have millions of rupees, you know, so that makes me satisfied. No, that is like, you know, hat ka mail hai, you know, rupiah hat ka mail hai, you know, it is here today and gone. But considering you don't have, it is true, you have wealth today, you have homes in four countries, you've got accolades, you've got it all, and yet you go on relentlessly like a single-minded horse. There are no children in your life. What's the trip? I have, I have plenty to leave to my children. <laughs> it's true. But I mean, that's another story altogether. Tell me. But, <laughs> no, I want to hear this. <laughs> well, that is another interview. The second no, no, you part. have to give me a, little, give me a trailer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, there is, there is a great deal, you know. No, no, you don't. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm just saying that I'm, I'm still young. I'm still energetic. I'm still, you know, uh, in my prime. And, you know, one says that, you know, after 50, you really start life. Mm. So, I mean, I still have to go. I've only done one part of it. And uh, there'll be still marriage, you know, there'll be children, you know. So there's still, you know, a lot one can have. Do you want children? Of course. Very much. And there is, of course. You know, children are a part of you. You know, when you go to meet somebody and they ask you, you know, how much money do you have? No. How many children do you have? So that's a, that's a very important thing. You know, you still will have to hurry up. I agree with the 50 years. You know, we still have to hurry up. You won't be, you know, your children will grow up without uh, a young dad. You've got to do something fast. The dad will always be young. I think you've got somebody in mind. Well, yeah, Ismail, you found somebody. A vague idea I have. Vague idea. Is she um, Indian or is she uh, Western? No, Indian. It has to be Indian. has to be Indian. Yeah. For me, it has to be Indian. And... Um, she probably have to be in the same business as you. No, 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 no. A business is what? What is business? You know, it's a, It's not something which you want to draw from the same world. You know, it'd be nice to have someone from the outside world. You know, it's much more than to much more exciting. <laughs> I think you found her. I think you know who it is. <laughs> you don't want to tell me now. Not yet. I think there's you know for the audience and for you there has to be the suspense. You see how this, so, <laughs> this producer again. <laughs> I'm talking to the human being. To That's the, the human being. When do you think this will happen? Well, I will let you know. You will be the first one. Promise. <laughs> Promise. She she and I. <laughs> but it'll be 1998. 
Well, not, but before year 2000. Before the year 2000. <laughs> oh, Which is around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be so, so much in control of your life. You vulnerable? Mm, well, vulnerable, I wouldn't say. Uh, I mean, there are certain weaknesses one has, but uh, I wouldn't say that I'm vulnerable. I mean, you, you, you know, like p things that affect you, you know, things that, that are that are dear to your heart, you know, and something that goes wrong to it, then you feel let down, you know, then you feel, you feel sort of not given the right due. What depresses you? Depressed? I'm never depressed. Never. Tell me, what frightens you? Do you fear anything in life? Well, f fear, I have never had any fear about anything. You know, I just never would sort of sit back or sort of think about, you know, something that is going to frighten me. It just doesn't. So you don't have any fears? No. That's why you can fly so high, <laughs> you know? There's nothing pulling you down, any fear of anything. Would you, would, you, would you ever think of writing your autobiography? Well, I've been asked to. I've been asked many times to do that. But I said, well, it will take about many volumes and you'll have to pay me a lot of money. <laughs> Can't get you on the cheap. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. You know, it's been so wonderful talking to you. Um. And I wish I could wish you success, but you have so much of it. <laughs> well, but still, I would need your you know, good wishes. You have my good thank wishes you. for continued success. Thank you. And I want to thank you for this roundtable. Thank you. Very much.